All right, welcome. Good to have you all here. I'm supposed to start with my spiel, aren't I? According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome. Good to have you with us today. Uh, we are ready for chapter five, the hermeneutics of dispensationalism. This is uh, March 24th. We are going to keep the schedule going, so that means next week on Easter Sunday, we will stay and have our 2.30 class for chapter 6. It's a short week, only 20 pages to read, so uh, that's a benefit. We have kind of a long chapter this week with 27 pages, so uh, next week will be, will be much easier. Did you do the reading? Yes, you did, yes, you did, yes, you did. All right, did you not do the reading? I didn't see your hand, either one. Okay, left hand. There, that's the honesty hand. Appreciate that. All right. The hermeneutics of dispensationalism. I cannot stress enough how important this chapter is. It's, it's the, the, whole, the whole emphasis is right here. Okay? And we are dispensational because of our hermeneutic, not the other way around. We didn't pick a literal hermeneutic because of our dispensational theology. We ended up with a dispensational theology because of the literal hermeneutic. And that's the order, and that's, uh, that's true every time. So we need to be clear on that and, uh, and knock that out here in chapter 5. Got a lot to cover. Uh, I colored a lot, included a quiz. The quiz is posted already. I don't know if you saw it or not. Posted that early this morning, so it's already there. And also, I freely admit, I kind of ran out of enthusiasm by the end of the quiz. So the quiz did not cover the last part of the chapter when you got to the Sermon on the Mount or those issues there, I did not include any quiz questions on that. I probably should have, but uh, you guys are uh, lucky because I just ran out of enthusiasm putting the, uh, putting the quiz together. So let's start with a word of prayer, dedicating our time for the glory of Jesus Christ and uh, preparing our heart for study, shall we pray? Almighty Father, we come before you today once again just thankful for your faithfulness, thankful for grace and truth, rejoicing in the privilege and blessing that we have to study to show ourselves approved. Father, we uh, commit this time to you now for your good pleasure and for our blessing. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Welcome, welcome. You missed the confession hour. Did you read it? Did you not read it? Okay. Fair enough. The hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science that furnishes the principles of interpretation. That's what the verb hermeneuo means. Uh, the character Hermes in Greek mythology, he was the translator, he was the, the messenger of the gods. And that's what uh, the term refers to. Make this text slightly bigger, this text over here. There we go. So these principles guide and govern anybody's system of theology. More often than not, if you find yourself in a theological debate with somebody, at its core, you're really in a hermeneutical debate with somebody. Every time, without fail. And I have discovered that if I was to change my hermeneutics and employ what they're using, I would end up at their theology also. And so, really, that's where uh, these debates come down to. They, and realize that your hermeneutic, your standard for interpretation, ought to be determined before one's theology is systematized. Doesn't always happen that way, and not everybody is as honest about it as, uh, as we try to be. In practice, the reverse is usually true, at least in the awareness of most people. And it probably, I don't know, it should be front-loaded more in the different seminary programs that you put the hermeneutics up front and then get into the systematic theology, into the process. I think you do yourself a huge favor that way. Most people know something of the doctrines they believe in, but little of the hermeneutics on which they have been built. And, and really, that was my experience. Uh, from childhood, I was grounded in solid doctrine. From childhood, I was raised on uh, RB theme and Baraka church type doctrine. And then uh, when I started to become a pastor and I started going to seminary, that's when I had to start to realize, wait a minute, where is, what, what, what Bible passage do I turn to so I can find the edification complex of the soul, or I can find the, the divine dinosphere, I can find, you know, what order do these gates come in? I'm trying to find the basis, the biblical basis that underlies a lot of the doctrinal teaching. So, did you have a question on that? Okay, behind you there. I was just curious, um, 
Is hermeneutic a term that's mainly used in theological realms, or is it used in in the secular realm at all? Because it seems like pretty much every debate comes down to a method of interpretation of of facts. Uh, so right, yeah. Um, I, I think it's mostly theological that I've seen it. I don't know that I've seen it in secular. Um, yeah, I don't think I've seen it in secular okay. works. Yeah. So. Um, the principles of interpretation are basic, which means they underlie other principles. Preferably should be established before attempting to interpret the word so that the results are not only correct interpretations, but that a right system of theology growing out of those interpretations. So you have all of these and you combine them together into your system of theology. But it's a house of cards if your hermeneutic is flawed to start with. Then you end up with a whole bucket full of bad interpretations that you try to then combine together into a, into a theological framework, uh, but the foundation is absolutely flawed. Um, update to his original book. He has some recent developments, and I am highly uh, critical of two of the three. I would just personally. Uh, I do find value in some of the recent linguistic studies that are available. Uh, the area of linguistics has contributed to understanding concerning language structure, and that's very valuable. Uh, general semantics that has aided biblical interpretation. And remember, we talked about this in prolegomena, in systematic theology, uh, because the Bible conveys thought. We have to handle thought components logically, that logic is the science that governs thought, and that because it's in written language, that the written languages of the Bible have to be handled linguistically, and, uh, and this is all by God's design for choosing to put his word into a written form using human languages. So, um, yes, principles of logic, principles of linguistics are absolutely critical for um, interpretation. And, and the best illustration, or one of the, a great illustration we recently had in Ephesians is why is it that the pronoun in Ephesians cannot refer to faith in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? By grace you have been saved through faith and that, not of yourselves. The that is, is a neuter pronoun and cannot refer to faith as a, as a feminine antecedent. So uh, linguistics is, is vital. He references here, um, what is the footnote on this? There we go. Exegetical fa uh, fallacies by D.A. Carson and Moise Silva. Biblical words and their meaning. Um, I failed to look up Silva. I think I have both. There's uh, exegetical fallacies there by uh, Carson. And then this is the hermeneutical spiral by Grant Osborne. That gets referenced shortly. Anyway, I'm positive towards point one. I'm, I'm more skeptical with respect to genre. Uh, there's been a focus on literary approach to scripture or a focus on the different genres found in scripture. Now, I'm okay with genre in, in general terms because we have such a variety in the Bible. We have poetry, we have prose, we have uh, apocalyptic literature, we have a, a variety, we've got allegory. There's, there's a variety of forms linguistic forms and literary forms that are found in the Bible, but we still employ the same hermeneutic across the board. We're literal regardless. And, and then we handle the metaphors accordingly, the figures of speech accordingly, but we start with the literal meanings of the literal words as the foundation for any idioms or figures of speech or uh, uh, non-literal expressions. So I um, hope that makes sense. What, what these liberals do with their genre um, refinements is they use genre as an excuse to, to abandon the literal hermeneutic. And they'll say, see, with this form of literature, like Revelation being an apocalyptic literature, then you can abandon the literal hermeneutic because the genre demands that you handle it allegorically. Okay? And... They do that because they want to handle it allegorically, which we see is consistently the pattern for covenant theology, that they will always, always replace their systematic theology or their uh, literal hermeneutic with figurative language in prophetic eschatological passages. Then the third item, I'm also this uh, hermeneutical spiral. I'm very skeptical. Um, the role of pre-understanding in one's approach to interpretation and this is like you're, you're truly embracing your subjectivity and you're, you're glad for it because uh, you end up with this cycle where you bring your interpretation to a set of principles, but then you also mix in the theological presuppositions as well as personal and cultural predispositions, and then you go back and you do it all over again, and you add to it and you keep doing these cycles, 
and um, called the hermeneutical spiral. We spiral from our predispositions and hermeneutics to the exegesis of Scripture and developing our theology, and then we cycle through it again, expecting that each cycle will help us grow into a better understanding of God's Word. And it, it just, it's, it's artificially contrived, and in practice, it's a nightmare. It's absolutely horrible. Okay? And it's, uh, I think it's a, a feature of our current generation and, and recent generations in which the lived experience trumps everything else. And it really shuts down the argument. You can't debate anything with me because my lived experience uh, tells you to, uh, to be quiet and leave me alone. So, anyway, that's enough on that. There's no quiz questions in that section, and uh, we can let that go for now. Um, historically among evangelicals, really there's two dominant, and if you're talking to an a, a, uh, evangelical Protestant, okay, then they're going to fall into either the dispensational camp in the minority or the covenant camp in the vast majority of, uh, of Protestants. So among evangelicals, you've got these two positions, dispensational and covenant. And it's unfortunate that he calls them hermeneutical positions. They're really theological positions that are based upon different hermeneutics. It'd be better if he changed that word to theological. Recently, a third position has appeared, that of progressive dispensationalism, which uh, attempted to be middle ground, attempted to reach out to try to find a common uh, uh, agreement with the covenant people, and instead it just ended up being a surrender and a capitulation to the covenant side. And we'll see that in this chapter. Ryrie does a great job pointing that out here in this chapter, even though he reserves most of his uh, critique of uh, progressive dispensationalism until chapter 9. So here's our view, the dispensational position. I don't apologize for being a dispensationalist. It's, uh, to me, it's, it's the only way to be fair to the text, that we employ the same hermeneutic Jesus employed when he was proclaiming Old Testament passages in his own teaching ministry. So literal hermeneutics. Dispensationalists claim that their principles of hermeneutics is that of literal interpretation. This means interpretation that gives to every word the same meaning it would have in normal usage whether employed in writing, speaking, or thinking. So words mean what they mean, and we find what they mean. And if they, whatever variety is built into those words is self-evident based on its usage and its context. Sometimes called the principle of grammatical historical interpretation. So there's a lot of synonyms here, and you're going to have to pick these out in your quiz. So when we're talking literal, it's the same thing as when we say grammatical historical. It's the same thing when we say normal. It's the same thing when we say plain. Okay, and what it's opposed to is all the, the bad stuff that's out there, including allegorical and symbolic and, and theological and all the, the compromises that we're going to see here shortly. Um, now, obviously, it's a, it's a criticism that's unva unfounded and totally invalid when the, when the other side will accuse us of being hyperliteral or too literal. Uh, my question is, well, there's no such thing. <laughs> you know, li you're literal or you're not. And um, anyway, symbols, figures of speech, types, they're all interpreted plainly in this method. We don't abandon our literal hermeneutic. In fact, you have to have a literal hermeneutic to properly interpret the symbols and the types and the, the figurative language that's there. It is in no way contrary to literal interpretation. When we use a metaphor, metaphors are great. Jesus said, I am the door. So we understand door, the word, literally, but then we take the expression as a metaphor and we're fine. But he used the word door because he didn't want to use the, he didn't use the, the word window, right? He wanted it to be door, and, and door communicates what door communicates as opposed to alternatives that he might have used. Anyway, figures often make the meaning plainer, but it is the literal, normal, or plain meaning that conveys to the reader. So you've got some great quotes here on this and uh, the benefit of the literal hermeneutic. We'll have more to say on this. In fact, this chapter kind of gives you a preview of what a full-blown uh, uh, full hermeneutic course would, uh, would cover as well. So it's a good introductory chapter to the concept. Many reasons, but he says at least three are worthy of mentioning at this point. He starts philosophically. Since the purpose of language itself seems to require literal interpretation. I mean, what are we doing when we're talking? Why did God invent language? Why did God devise 
the method by which we verbally communicate my thoughts to you so that you can have my thoughts and, uh, and understand what's being said. Language was given by God for the purpose of being able to communicate with mankind. And the whole Babel episode where he scattered the languages affected what he intended it to affect because of a literal hermeneutic. And all the people speaking those different languages had to self-segregate into those languages as God dispersed them across the globe. So that's a philosophical argument. Since uh, God intended for these languages to be understood, that's why he designed them in that way. Scriptures cannot be regarded as an illustration of some special use of language. The idea of God talk being different from non-God talk, being different from somehow if we're talking about politics or the weather or news or something, that you can take what I say literally, but as soon as I get into God talk and I start speaking about spiritual things or things of the Lord, that whoa, all of a sudden we have an entirely different game plan for the rules of logic and thought and, and communication, linguistics and all the rest. That's just crazy. If language is the creation of God for the purpose of conveying his message, then a theist must view that language as sufficient in scope and normative in use. I love that. Sufficient in scope, normative in use to accomplish the purpose for which God originated it. Now, I think in Prolegomena, under Geisler, we had some discussion related to objections. Is truth knowable? Uh, since God is infinite, can human language... Uh, completely and fully develop what God is. We're not talking about fully and completely or infinitely. We're talking about adequately. Is it, does it do what it was designed to do? Is human language adequate to describe the things of God? And why did God condescend to put his word in human language? So that we finite beings could understand it. Second reason is a biblical reason. We've had a philosophical reason, a biblical reason, and then we'll have a logical reason. But the biblical reason, the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Christ, they were all literal, okay? His virgin birth, his childhood, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, everything that we see when we read the gospel accounts of the first advent, we see literal fulfillments. They pierced my hands and my feet we see literal fulfillment of over 100 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the first advent of Jesus Christ. So if that was the case, why do we switch for the second advent fulfilled prophecies? It makes no sense. And, and especially when you realize that many of the prophecies were blended. First and second prophecies, very, uh, second advent prophecies, very frequently uh, were combined in the same prophetic revelation. And, uh, and so the, the idea of splitting a hermeneutic taking the, the first advent literally and the second advent figuratively is just not fair to Scripture. It's not fair to the Old Testament prophets. It turns God into a deceiver, into a liar. And, uh, and it's just, it's, to me, it's the biggest reason of all. And then the logical reason. If one does not use the plain, normal, or literal method of interpretation, all objectivity is lost. And, and I don't know how you argue that or argue against that. It, it, either it is noble-minded or it's not noble-minded, noble like the Bereans, to search the scriptures and see if these things are so. And if it's noble-minded like the Bereans to search the scriptures and see if these things are so, what does that tell you? You have to be using a literal hermeneutic. Otherwise, you can't search the scriptures and see if these things are so. You just have to search the scriptures and create your own hermeneutic and see if you can outsell and outcompete and argue against the other guy. That's not what we're told to do. What check would there be on the variety of interpretations that, that man's imagination could produce? I mean, it really is open to the, the, whatever the imagination can come up with. Okay? You know, it's like before he died, uh, David Koresh, the cult leader in Waco, was, was supposedly coming up with his interpretation of, of, uh, of, of Revelation, right? He was talking about the seven churches and he had all these things. And in, he was not employing a literal hermeneutic, clearly, uh, but it was all just the product of his, uh, of his imagination. I'm guessing that's how he justified uh, building a compound and marrying a bunch of women and accumulating all those guns and whatever else goes into being a cult leader. <laughs> All right. Slow, slow me down. Stop me if, if I've gone past anything that you've already been disappointed in. To me, this is foundational stuff. And for philosophical reasons, biblical reasons, logical reasons, uh, just abandoning the literal hermeneutic is, to me, it's insane. It means 
that that hermeneutic doesn't get you to the conclusion you want to get to. And so because you have a predetermined conclusion where you want to arrive here, then you have to pick the vehicle that gets you there. And if you want to be a, uh, uh, a, a covenant theologian then, and you want to get to that conclusion, then you're going to have to allegorize the, the kingdom prophecies, the eschatological prophecies that are yet unfulfilled. This paragraph is vital. Bottom of page 92, top of page 93. And, and because some of our critics will claim that they use a literal hermeneutic also. And they say, oh, you guys aren't special. We, ha- we use the same hermeneutic. They do sometimes, but not exclusively, not all the time, not consistently. The key word is consistently and non-negotiable, okay? Literal interpretation is not the exclusive property of dispensationalists. Most conservatives would agree with what has just been said, even the covenant conservatives. What then is the difference between dispensationalist use of this principle and the non-dispensationalist? It lies in the claim to use the normative principle consistently in all his study of the Bible, including prophecy, including eschatology, including the things that are still future from our perspective here in uh, 2024 AD. Is that what year it is? 2024, okay. Lost track of the year for a moment. All right. Consistently. He further claims that the non-dispensationalist does not use the principle everywhere. And we can claim that because they themselves admit that repeatedly. They make no secret of the fact that they do uh, they have different hermeneutics for their eschatology, and they mock us for ours because we're not sophisticated enough to switch streams in the middle of the horse, okay? Or switch horses in the middle of the stream. I always mess that up. That, they, uh, that, that we're the fools for staying literal everywhere, and we don't have the, the nuance of, uh, of their understanding. So we can claim that, and we are correct, and they agree with us. He admits that the non-dispensationalist is a literalist in much of his interpretation of the scriptures, but charges him with allegorizing or spiritualizing when it comes to the interpretation of prophecy. We claim that. They themselves claim that. There's no argument. The dispensationalist claims to be consistent in his use of the principle. He accuses the non-dispensationalist of being inconsistent in his use of it. And so there's different examples that he has here, and some of these are excellent. Um, I highlighted a couple of them, I think. And when they think they can have equivalents, like you don't think they're literally chariots in the end times, do you? And so if we can update the weaponry, if we can update the, the kinds of vehicles that the army is fighting in, then that's, uh, that's licensed to just go allegorically imaginative for everything else that you come across in the scriptures. No. No consistency, absolute consistency. And now here's some of the confessions. Floyd Hamilton, who is amillennial, okay? Understand premillennial, amillennial, there is no millennium. It's just a, an allegory. It's idealized and, and we're, or we're in it already kind of a thing. He says, this is Frank Hamilton himself, his own writings, We must frankly admit that a literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies gives us just such a picture of an earthly reign of the Messiah as the premillennialist pictures. He's saying we're right if we use the literal hermeneutic. That was the kind of messianic kingdom that the Jews of the time of Christ were looking for. Why were they looking for that kind of a kingdom? Because of the literal hermeneutic that that they employed, that we employ, that Jesus employed. That's what they were expecting on the basis of a literal kingdom interpretation of Old Testament promises. Great. But having said this, he naturally arrives at a different picture of the kingdom on the basis of a different hermeneutic. And he feels that he's found justifiable reasons for spiritualizing the concept of the kingdom. So he admits it, and then he says he has good reasons. And we don't think there are such good reasons. Okay? We're literal because the, it, God means what he says and says what he means and words mean what they mean. Anyway, that's one example. So the change from literal is not, uh, is not difficult to see in all millennialism. Uh, Vern Poitras. And this one's sad because I, I like Vern. 
I've read a lot of his stuff. He's great uh, as an apologeticist. I think he's got good material out there for logic and, and other things. I've, I've enjoyed his writings, but he is a flaming five-pointer, okay? So he's a hardcore Calvinist, and he, um, he mocks our, our hermeneutic. He's a covenant theologian, differentiates between eschatological and pre-eschatological fulfillments of prophecy. All right. Though he maintains that both are based on grammatical, historical, and interpretation. He says that, but then he contradicts himself shortly. I claim that there is sound, solid, grammatical, historical ground for interpreting eschatological fulfillments of prophecy on a different basis than pre-eschatological fulfillments. That's his admission right there. But he says he has good reasons. All right. So, it's a move away from grammatical historical interpretation to insist that the house of Israel and the house of Judah in Jeremiah 31, 31 must, with dogmatic certainty, be interpreted in the most prosaic biological sense, a sense that an Israelite might be likely to apply as a rule of thumb in a short-term prediction. See, this is the thing. We, we, we read it, and we have no problem. The house of Israel, the house of Judah, it applies to Israel. It's not the church. The church was unknown to Jeremiah. The church was still mystery until the New Testament. Anyway. And then he himself comes back and he compromises. You know, a few verses, the same passage, God links the certainty of this promise to the nation, to the fixed order of the sun, moon, and stars. Well, aren't we, don't we take that literally? I mean, are we talking about the real sun, moon, and stars there? What, you know, what's the control on this allegory we're inventing? Anyway. The premillennialist who is non-dispensational also compromises the literal principle. Here's Daniel Fuller in his admission. He calls it theological interpretation. So he uses literal in many places. Jesus was literally born of a virgin, literally died on a cross, literally, you know, the, the first advent's literal. He's fine with that. But then second advent, now we have to go theological. We, have, we can't stay literal. So this is Fuller's quote. In covenant theology, there is a tendency to impute to passages a meaning which would not be gained merely from their historical and grammatical associations. It means you can't read it for yourself. You can't just read it and let the plain language of the text communicate what it, you think it communicates. So you've got to have the theological training to read it with the right lens to interpret it to get you to that covenant conclusion. Yes, this phase of interpretation is called the theological interpretation. Okay. So I have a question for uh, Ephesians 2.17, because if we, we, we do literal interpretation, and then earlier on to his class, uh, you mentioned... You said, you said Ephesians 2.17? Yes, sir. Okay. He, so, and he came and preached peace to you who were f far away. Um, you mentioned that that was the second coming, not the first advent, and that's not the second advent as well. Um, were you talking about like he he came and preached like spiritually through through us, or back then through through the believers? Okay, so you're talking about the class this morning in the Ephesians class at 9:30. Okay, so it's still literal hermeneutic. This is a quotation from Isaiah, but. We, we handle the Isaiah quotation literally in its Isaiah context. We handle the Ephesians quotation literally in its Ephesians context. Now, they're the same words, but the context is widely different between how Paul's using it in Ephesians and how Isaiah is using it in Isaiah. And so this is a, this is a marvelous example of why we don't take the Ephesian understanding and then retroactively force it onto Isaiah. As if Isaiah now has to be proclaiming the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Isaiah knew nothing about any of that. So in, in the Isaiah context, the, those who are near, those who are far, is, is talking about the Jews of the diaspora. The diaspora, they're scattered all around the world. And all of them are being welcomed back into the kingdom, back to return to Israel for the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. But in Ephesians, you who are far away, you who are near, 
that has the context of Israel and, and the Gentiles that were being united together into one person in the church. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's literal, but we have it literal in each context. We don't reinterpret Isaiah because of how Paul uses it in Ephesians. And also to just uh, confirm, in Ephesians 2.17, it is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in his body, correct? Physically. No, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, that's the present reality of the church, whereby Christ lives in you, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and we have both Christ and the Spirit mentioned in verse 17 and verse 18. When he came in, he preached. Yes. He didn't, that's not talking. That's not a physical bodily coming, no. Okay. 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 All right. Good questions, and perfect timing, because that relates well to what we were just looking at at 9.30 this morning. Anyway, so Fuller is admitting here that in covenant theology, um, you have to impute meanings. You're imputing meanings, which is eisegesis, not exegesis. You're reading into the text a theological understanding that you're not drawing from the text. Because just reading the, the normal historical grammatical associations, you would never come to the conclusion you come to unless you inject that theology in, in the first place. And he calls it a theological interpretation. And that's quite an admission, as Ryrie says. It means that the covenant premillennialist is not consistent literalist by his own statement. And because if he, if he was going to be consistent, he would end up dispensational. And he admits that, he knows that, we know that. So, um, and then he talks about Fuller and his statements related to Abraham. Thus, the non-dispensationalist is not consistent, literal, in his own admission, but has to introduce another hermeneutical principle, what he calls the theological method, in order to have a hermeneutic basis for the system he holds. And really, at that point, it's no longer a hermeneutical basis, because it's artificial. It's injected the theology and uses that theology to determine how you want to read it, instead of reading it for what it says. One suspects that the conclusions determine the means used to arrive at them, which is a charge usually hurled at dispensationalists. The only reason you, you are so literal is because you want to end up at the dispensational conclusion. I've been told that. You will too at some point in time. When a dispensational critic accuses you of, well, you only hold that hermeneutic because it takes you where you want it to take you. No, it takes me where it takes me. And I consistently employ because I'm an imitator of Christ and he employed that hermeneutic. And it's the only, it's the, it's logically, it's the only way to be fair. With first advent being literal, why, why would I switch to something else for second advent? Also, if there's not a literal future for Israel, then God's a liar. And he said, I will not lie to David. David has a son who's destined to sit on that throne, and David will be resurrected to sit on that throne again. God is not a liar. There is a kingdom for Israel in the future. Now, sometimes they weasel out and they try to claim, well, it meant what it meant until the New Testament. And now that we have progressive revelation, then what we now know in the New Testament allows us to rewrite or reinterpret or change what we think the Old Testament used to mean. It doesn't mean that anymore because of progressive revelation. And that's horrible, okay? New revelation cannot, this is on your quiz, New Testament revelation cannot mean contradictory revelation. You know, you can't just contradict and say, oh, that's not true, okay? And, and what used to be called true is now called false. That means somebody was lying, either then or now. New, Testament, new revelation cannot mean contradictory revelation. Later revelation on the subject does not make the earlier revelation mean something different. It meant what it meant at the time, and it still means that. It may add to it, or even supersede it. Like in the church, we have dietary blessings now that superseded the dietary restrictions that Israel was under, under Mosaic law. But that hasn't changed the meaning of what those, the, the dietary restrictions were at the time they were given under Mosaic law. 
A word or a concept cannot mean one thing in the Old Testament and take on opposite meaning in the New Testament. So, kingdom. If it's a literal physical kingdom with a literal physical throne with a literal physical son of David, then that's what it is. And if you try to spiritualize all that and say, well, no, Israel's now the church because we replaced them and because you know, now the kingdom is in you, it's in your heart or whatever, then you're changing what the original promise was and all those Old Testament believers who died in faith went to their graves believing a lie. And God's not a liar. So, uh, if that flawed approach is true, then um, the Bible will be filled with contradictions and God would have to be conceived of as deceiving the Old Testament prophets when he revealed to them a nationalistic kingdom. Since he would have known at the time that he was completely going to reverse that concept in a later revelation. I mean, he either has foreknowledge or not, and if, if their replacement view is true, then God was very dishonest to let them, to string them along thinking they had an earthly kingdom on the way. The true concept of progressive revelation is like a building. Certainly the superstructure does not replace the foundation. Amen. I mean, imagine replacing the foundation with a, with a superstructure. Now, in spite of this fallacy, Fuller does just this. And he, he pleads for the patients to pursue the inductive method of Bible study. Great, I'm all for it. But he doesn't do it. And that's the problem. The inductive method of Bible study, which is nothing more than the scientific method, seeking to gain all the facts before drawing some general conclusions from them. All right, I'm on board. We, we, that, we eat that up. That's our, that's our method too. This is a worthy plea for such an approach to Bible study is the only safe one, but, and here's where none of them follow through, to do an induction on the word Israel or the word church, start with that. And see every time Israel is used, from Genesis to Revelation. See every time church is used from Israel, to, from Genesis to Revelation. Fuller might then have seen more easily why the dispensationalist believes that God has two distinct purposes. One for Israel and one for the church. In the progress of Revelation, there has been no change in the meaning of these words. So there's progress, there's additional information, there's supplementary information, especially about the church that was not known in the Old Testament. It was mystery unrevealed in the Old Testament. But now it's revealed, now we can add it to what the Old Testament believers knew, and we have this thing called Israel, we have this thing called the church. And they are not identical, they can't be. They have to be different people groups, they have to be different origin, purpose, nature, everything. And we're not going to redefine Israel based upon the subsequent understanding of church. The theological principle of hermeneutics may allow a blending of the two, but a true progressive revelation with a literal hermeneutic does not. The same hermeneutical principles must apply to all revelation regardless of the time in which it was given. So, yeah, and, and you know, it'd be like, uh, standing before your bride on your wedding day and making covenant promises of faithfulness and marriage and then deciding uh, after five years, ten years, whatever, deciding that uh, you were going to still be faithful to those covenant promises is just, uh, you, you've got a different woman in mind now, so um, I'm going I'm to stay faithful to my wedding vows is just, I've got a different bride, okay? And your first bride would say, you're a liar, you're a snake, and, and that's not, how do you do that? How do you stay faithful to your promises to Israel by keeping them with the church? Okay? You're a two-timing liar, and it doesn't work. And it doesn't work, you know, in marriage. It doesn't work in theology. It doesn't work in uh, anywhere. So, um, and, and this is a little bit nuanced in here, too, talking about the amillennialist, the covenant premillennialist. Uh, they have slight variance between themselves. Uh, where the church and Israel are somewhat blended, not amalgamated. Um, try to have them conflated now, but then sometimes different in the millennium, distinct in the millennium. No, we're different now and then and forever. The dispensationalist studies the words in the New Testament, finds that they are kept distinct always, and therefore concludes that when the church was introduced, God did not abrogate his promises. In other words, break. Okay, Prove himself a liar. 
He did not abrogate his promises to Israel or enmesh them into the church. This is why the dispensationalist recognizes two purposes of God and insists on maintaining the distinction between Israel and the church. All of this is built on an inductive study of the use of the two words, not a scheme superimposed on the Bible. We get there because of our hermeneutic. We don't start with that as a premise and then force that understanding every time we see the word Israel, every time we see the word church. We do it the other way around. It's always the interpretation first, and then the inductive conclusion is undeniable. Built on a consistent use of the literal, normal, and plain method of interpretation. All right. And that's why the distinction between Israel and the church is a sine qua non of dispensationalism. I mean, it just fundamentally comes down to that. Hmm. So, the non-dispensational position. Okay, this one, we've seen theological. That's not a synonym for literal. And now we get spiritual. That's not a synonym for literal. We have synonyms for literal that include grammatical, historical. It includes normal, includes plain. Okay? But it does not include theological and it does not include spiritual. It does not include complementary. These are all the bad approaches that the... Uh, the uh, other side tries to make use of. So, um, the spiritual hermeneutic, allowing for a symbolic meaning of a passage. Don't take it literally. It's a symbol. Adam and Eve weren't real people. They were a symbol. There wasn't really a, a, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a symbol. The, 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 the Adam and Eve story, the Garden of Eden, it's a symbol. It's an allegory. It's, 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 it conveys a message of obedience or disobedience or right or wrong or you know, a moral dilemma, blah, blah, blah. No, it's literal. They were real people in a real garden, and Jesus said so. All right. In criticizing literal hermeneutics, <laughs> this just kills me, Louis Burkhoff, without blushing, without being embarrassed, with a straight face, Louis Burkhoff states, the theory of premillennialism is based on a literal interpretation of Israel and of the kingdom of God which is entirely untenable. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's based on a literal interpretation. So he's, he admits that we're right using our hermeneutic, but then he says, no, you can't, you can't go there. It's untenable. You can't be such a literalist. And then to support his spiritual hermeneutic, he states, the New Testament does contain abundant indications of the spiritual fulfillment of the promises given to Israel. He's, he claims that, but he can't sustain that claim uh, to our satisfaction, maybe at his own satisfaction. Um, so a spiritual fulfillment of a promise is the same thing as a broken promise. Okay? It'd be like, you know, you, you told your child to make their bed, and they say, well, I spiritually made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah? Well, I use a literal hermeneutic, and you better make that literal bed, or you're going to get a literal spanking. Okay. This approach has led to non-dispensationalists to equate, or at least to merge, Israel and the church. And it's just, it's a horrible conflation. As far as they take it, some more than others, to any extent, it's wrong. Resulting in a spiritualizing and yet unfulfilled blessings promised to Israel by having them fulfilled presently in the church. All right, here's another uh, villain, Oswald. And when I say villain, remember, they're born again, they're saved, we're going to be in heaven with them forever. <laughs> But their theologies are harmful and wrong, and their hermeneutic is awful. So God bless them. They know better now. Most of these guys are dead. They've, they've been remedied in their flawed hermeneutic. But here's Alice, Oswald Alice. One of the most marked features of premillennialism in all its forms is that the emphasis which it places on the literal interpretation of Scripture. Okay, thank you, Oswald. I agree. It is the insistent claims of its advocates, that only when interpreted literally is the Bible interpreted truly. Uh, I agree. He's, he's correct. And they denounce as spiritualizers or allegorizers those who, I want to interrupt and say those who spiritualize and allegorize the Bible, but I'll, I'll finish this quote. They denounce as spiritualizers or allegorizers those who do not interpret the Bible with the same degree of literalness as they do. 
Okay, and, and you can just see the admission right there. And he concludes, none have made this charge more pointedly than the dispensationalists. Well, good for us. In his words, the issue is the same degree of literalness or consistency in the use of literalism. So he's agreeing with, with Ryrie here. It's the consistent use of the literal hermeneutic. We heard this a couple of weeks ago at the Schaefer Conference. It's one of the hallmarks of Schaefer Seminary. The consistent use of the literal, normal, plain interpretation of Scripture. So we apply it consistently, everywhere, including prophecy, whereas the non-dispensationalist does not apply it to prophecy. They're happy to have, and, and to the, they, they, so here's the thing, when you say they don't apply it to prophecy, well, they do, they're happy to apply it to all of the first Advent prophecies. And this is where maybe people don't dawn on them at all, but a virgin shall conceive and bear a son was prophetic when it was spoken. It was prophetic as Isaiah uttered it. And it stayed prophetic for 700 years until a virgin conceived and bore a son. And then it was fulfilled, but it remains a prophecy. And they have no problem taking those prophecies literally, but they switch for the other set of prophecies that are still future in their awaiting fulfillment. Does that make sense? And so because there's more second advent prophecies than first advent prophecies. Um, they, 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 they're fine calling the yet unfulfilled prophecies prophecies, but then when they, they fail to realize that the, the ones that are fulfilled, they were also prophecies at the time. And, uh, and so that inconsistency is just glaring on that basis. So um, it's evident. He does not apply it to the other areas of truth. And this is evident from the simple fact that there is no disagreement with dispensationalists over these doctrines. So we're all in agreement over First Advent doctrines. Why, why are we all in agreement? Because the text says what it says, and it happened. Alice himself admits that the Old Testament prophecies, if literally interpreted, cannot be regarded as having been fulfilled yet or as being capable of fulfillment in this present age. What an admission. Okay? but it has a future fulfillment on the way when this present age is concluded. When the church is raptured out of here, all of the prophetic agenda for Israel can proceed. There's also non-dispensational premillennialists, the, the covenant uh, premill, historical premill guys, um, but they also are inconsistent in their applications. They're a little bit better than the amillennialists, but not as good as us. All right. George Peters. Are you familiar with George Peters? George N.H. Peters. I forget what the N.H. stands for. Lutheran guy, 1800s. He wrote a very comp... And he was not... I mean, he was not he wasn't. He was not a Darby Schofield Schaefer type dispensationalist. But he was a literal interpreter. And he did an exhaustive study on the kingdom, the theocratic kingdom that George N.H. Peters wrote about is, is still a future unfulfilled kingdom. And uh, it would put him at quite at odds with uh, most of his books were not bought by Lutherans. <laughs> they were bought by dispensationalists. But he, this is pretty, this is insight here. When he's talking about the dangers of spiritualizing the scriptures, the prophecies referring to the kingdom of God as now interpreted by a large majority of Christians, that's in the late 1800s, okay, in Europe, the, the ravages of the, of the German liberalism and the higher critics and all the destructive there, I mean, they did not believe in, in the literal fulfillment of the kingdom. As now interpreted by the large majority of Christians, afford the strongest leverage employed by unbelievers against Christianity. And he says, no wonder the, the unbeliever mocks us for uh, not believing the things of the future because we don't believe the things of the future. Right. The, uh, the, the literal, the spiritualizers, the allegorizers, the, the people that make excuses to say, well, the Bible doesn't really mean that, then the unbeliever can point to us and say, well, you don't believe what your own Bible says. Unfortunately, unbelief is often logically correct. It eagerly points to the predictions pertaining to David's son, showing that if language has any legitimate meaning, 
and words are adequate to express an idea, they unmistakably predict the restoration of David's throne and kingdom. And then the unbeliever can mock and say, see, it's not happened, it's never happened, it won't happen, it can't happen. They mock the expectation of the Jews, of Simeon, of the preaching of John, Jesus, and the disciples. Anyway, when you go liberal, when you go to allegorize your Bible, then you're just uh, feeding into the unbeliever's um, uh, playbook. All right. Let me get down through some of these other items. The use of the Old Testament in the New. Great example with Ephesians this morning. Then, the other issue, so remember, they inject their theology into what they read. Which means, for the covenant guys, this idea of the uh, covenant of grace. And they just put that in everywhere. They see that everywhere. And they, they force that understanding upon the text that they're dealing with. Quite obvious that the presupposition of the covenant of grace controls the covenant theologian's handling of text and issues involved in his criticism of dispensationalism. It so flavors their hermeneutic that it's just they can't escape it. And, and, and then they feel like we're the ones that, that are, are missing out because we don't inject that covenant theology into the passages that we're reading. So we're the ones that are falling short in their view because we fail to inject that theology in there. By the way, how, how is this any different than all the other heresies going on in our world, like black liberation theology, women's liberation theology, um, the original, I guess, liberation theology was in Latin America. The current pope was a huge proponent. So they take a political position, and then they view all scripture through that. So black liberation theology says uh, the world is full of oppressors and oppressed, and you have to read the Bible in the lens of those who are oppressed striving to be free, to overthrow the, the, uh, the, the oppressors that are over them. And so they, they have that worldview. They force that view into uh, the, the passages of Scripture that they want to twist and, and force to say uh, what they want them to say. Anyway, same thing. So... Black liberation, women's liberation, uh, Hispanic liberation, all these, uh, artif they're not even hermeneutics. They're just, um, you know, be like saying, well, I want to read the, um, and, and sometimes the, the Babylon Bee has these little parody articles that are so close to reality, it's not even, not even funny, but like trying to read the, the, uh, the, the Joe Biden Bible or trying to read the, the Harry Potter Bible or trying to read the, and we just, this is utter nonsense. But the Bible is written by whatever, and you force this worldview into the text, and it's, it's fine for a satire website or comedy or what have you, but these people are doing it in real life. They're putting their woke ideology into every passage that they read, and that's not a hermeneutic, but they're using it like a hermeneutic, and uh, it's taking them to the consequences of, of where they want to end up. So, yeah, bottom line questions. Is the covenant of grace stated in Scripture? No, and even they admit that. Even if it is, should it be the controlling presupposition of hermeneutics and theology? Do you allow a theological view to be up front to shape how you interpret a text? Even if there's a unity of redeemed peoples, does that remove disunities in God's program for his creations? So, yeah. And, and you'll encounter this a lot. They, they don't want to distinguish between Israel and the church, but they do distinguish between believers and unbelievers. Like, really? Okay, so you do draw distinctions. Not every distinction is bad. But they just want to take everybody who gets saved and just put them all in one big kumbaya, happy, we're all uh, the people of God. And they use that phrase, the people of God, as if that can then be uh, amorphous, general, that applies to Israel, the church, applies to, to whatever. They, they say that our distinctions are artificial, whereas theirs are vanilla generic enough to apply but they, they really don't. And, and you can catch them on this if you ask them about the angels. Well, are, are the angels any different? Does he have a purpose for the angels? Is his purpose for the angels the same as his purpose for us? Why does he provide redemption for us, but not the angels? What's, what's happening there? Okay. Anyway, the fallen angels can't have it, and the elect angels don't need it. And, uh, and, and there's obviously there's a difference between angelity and humanity. 
That alone proves that distinctions are, are conceivable in the plan of God. Why is the, a distinction between Israel and the church so unthinkable in, uh, in their view? Then you get to the progressive guys, and they introduce a complementary hermeneutic. So that's not literal. That's not normal, plain, grammatical, historical. All the synonyms for literal. It is a non-synonym because it's not literal. Complementary is no better than theological or spiritual or the other uh, phony forms that we've seen in this chapter. So, the issue is not a distinct hermeneutic, but a debate as to how to apply the hermeneutic that we share. Now, this is amazing. Introducing this complementary hermeneutics. We'll have more on this in chapter 9. In speaking of the issues still on the table to be discussed. So, Blazing and Bach, when they first wrote this, and this was in the early 90s when I was first starting seminary, the, um, they intended for it to be the opening of a conversation. They wanted it to be the first step to reaching out, finding middle ground. The flagship seminary of Dallas Seminary of Dispensationalism was reaching across the aisle to try to find common ground where they could come together with dispensationalists and covenant theologies uniting in a great kumbaya excitement of evangelical glory. And it failed because it was not a, uh, a, a progression of dispensationalism. It was an, a betrayal and an abandonment of dispensationalism and a surrender to covenant theology. But they say, in speaking of the issues still on the table to be discussed by covenant theologians and progressive dispensationalists, you know, we're going to talk these things out, we'll be on better grounds to do so than those old Walford Ryrie types. Blazing and Bach say the final issue on the table is hermeneutical. Why is that the final issue? It should be the first and only issue, and then we should say, okay, goodbye, we're done. We have our hermeneutic, you have yours. The issue is not a distinct hermeneutic. Ah. Did you see that? The issue is not a distinct hermeneutic, but debate about how to apply the hermeneutic that we share. In other words, the progressives share a hermeneutic with the covenant the theologians. The sharing is between covenantalists and progressives, not between progressives and normative dispensationalists. It's a betrayal of Schofield, Schaefer, Ryrie, Walvert, all the, the classic sine qua non dispensationalists in this universe. Further demonstrating the distance progressives wish to have between themselves and classic dispensationalists. Unquestionably, a literal hermeneutic consistently used has been a key feature of normative dispensationalism. That's why it's a sine qua non. And when you do away with it, without which it is not, so take it away, it is not. Sine qua non. So if you take it out, then it's not what it, you think it is. It's not what you're saying it is. It's just not. So if you, and to use my Aunt Phyllis as an ex example, um, I've told this story before, when um, Aunt Phyllis married my Uncle Dick, that uh, her specialty, she was so proud of her peanut butter cookies, and she was excellent, at, and, and in fact, Uncle Dick loved her for her, I don't know that he married her for the peanut butter cookies, but it was a big plus that she was great at peanut butter cookies, and so the first batch she made uh, in, in their young wedding, they just didn't taste right. There was, they were odd. And, and he didn't want to say anything to embarrass his new bride. They'd been married in just a short time. And then finally, she realized when she went back into the kitchen that the peanut butter was still sitting there and she had not included, she had left the peanut butter out of the, uh, the peanut butter cookies. And so to illustrate the sine qua non, without which it is not, if you, without the peanut butter, you don't have peanut butter cookies, okay? Whatever else you want, you can call them that. That's not what they are if you've left the peanut butter out. And so if you leave out the literal hermeneutic consistently implied, then you might call your system dispensational, but it's not. And so, it, you know, you have this label of progressive dispensationalism, and it's neither, because it's not a progress upon Schofield, Ryrie, Schaefer, and it's not uh, even dispensational when you leave out the literal hermeneutic because that's the, the sine qua non. And when you fail to distinguish, you start to muddy Israel and the church, which they do. Oh, I tell you. Our Savior is seated at the right hand of the Father, and praise God for that. That's a fundamental church age reality. But they say the right hand of the Father is the throne of David. And so they're conflating the present church with the future Israel promises. And there's no basis to do that. 
So they've actually lost two sine qua nons at that point. Anyway, there'll be more in chapter nine to, uh, to tear apart the uh, progressive dispensationalism view. Complementary hermeneutics. It's not a synonym for normal, plain, literal, grammatical, historical. All right, the results. If literal interpretation is the correct principle, it follows that it would be proper to expect it to apply to all of Scripture. I mean, if it's valid anywhere, why is it not valid everywhere? And as a concept, philosophically, biblically, logically, it's valid, then it needs to be applied everywhere. The reason the matter of consistency is so important. Stay consistent. Literal interpretation results in accepting the text of Scripture at its face value. And even the, the critics expect this. They, they admit this. They declare this. That they admit that if they used our hermeneutic, they would come to our dispensational conclusions. Based on the philosophy that God originated language for the purpose of communicating his message to man. That he intended man to understand that message. Literal interpretation seeks to interpret the message plainly. And since we do that with the first advent, why do we switch for second advent prophecies? You realize the whole understanding between first advent and second advent only became a reality when Israel rejected the Christ at first advent. And so then the kingdom was delayed. It was no longer at hand. So long as the kingdom was at hand, everything we call a second advent prophecy was also at hand. It was on the verge of being fulfilled. It was on the verge of happening then and there. They could have had their kingdom 2,000 years ago. So again, why, why not take them literally? Just because they've been delayed doesn't mean they've been replaced, abrogated, canceled, or spiritualized. So, um, yeah, take scripture at face value. Recognize distinctions. Male and female, he created them. Great. Distinctions. By God's design, not a problem. The dispensationalist recognizes different peoples of God simply because of distinctions maintained by the text as literally interpreted. Okay? They were an earthly people. We are a heavenly people. They, they had a land territory surrounded by the Gentile land territory. We are citizens of heaven. They were uh, Jews by physical birth. We are Christians by spiritual birth. We're born again, born by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They've got an eternal future, and we've got an eternal future, but theirs is earthly, ours is heavenly. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. They're not in Christ. Anyway, literal interpretation. You see why this chapter is so important? Consistent hermeneutical principle is the basis of dispensationalism. It is a sine qua non. All right. Of course, they view the whole Bible as basically centered on redemption, that the whole plan of God centers on salvation. The covenant approach uh, makes uh, soteriology the fulcrum of, of biblical revelation. The dispensationalist says, no, while we're happy about salvation, the soteriological doctrines are, are vital. They're, not the, they're the means to the end. They're not the end. It's not the be-all, end-all. God has a greater plan than just saving us, and uh, it's for his glory, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Saving us is a part of that, but it's not all of that not the totality of all of that. Have you lost your Bible? What a, what a sad uh, criticism of dispensationalism. So, um, and they talk about, well, we, we destroy the unity of the Bible because we compartmentalize things. We, we, we uh, they don't use, uh, um, you know, I like to talk about buckets, right? You have Put things in different buckets. You got a, you got a verse that, that centers on the election. Put it in its appropriate bucket. Is it the election of Israel, the election of the church, the elect angels, the election of Christ? You know, what, what chosen uh, bucket are you going to put this election verse into? Compartmentalizing the Bible. But that's not to destroy the unity of the Bible. It's to enhance the unity of the Bible. Showing all that variety enhances the unity of Scripture. And when they say that we've never taught the unity of Scripture, it's just a flat-out lie, because it's easily demonstrable. Schofield um, 
the introduction to the Schofield Reference Bible has this thing de designated to be read and it talks about the unity of the Bible and it gives these uh, seven different ways that the Bible is unified. Eric Sauer, W. Graham Scroggy. I just like saying the name Scroggy. The unfolding drama of redemption gives strong emphasis to the unity of the Bible, prominence to God's redemptive purpose. The reason why when we did our Through the Bible gear that it was consistently dispensational from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and it demonstrated the big picture framework of the unity of the entire Bible. Which I don't think covenant guys can do that. Because they have to keep injecting their Old Testament back into the, or their New Testament back into their Old Testament, and they've, got, they've rewritten their Old Testament with a New Testament theology that didn't exist until it was revealed in the, uh, as mystery doctrine to the apostles. This is a great paragraph here. Unity and distinction are not necessarily contradictory concepts. And I think in your quiz, this is where I asked you to write a paragraph to describe this. Um, just because there's distinctions does not necessarily in itself destroy unity. The human body is not disunited because the hand is distinct from the ear. The unity of a building is not impaired by carefully observing the distinctions between the iron and the wood that goes into it. I mean, those are just earthly illustrations. You've got biblical illustrations, too. The unity of Trinity is most certainly admitted by conservative opponents, yet these theologians very carefully distingu have distinctions between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you can have distinctions in members of the Godhead, but still have unity in the Godhead, why do you think there's, there's a problem with dispensationalists having distinctions between Israel and the church? It, it does not d destroy the unity of the Bible one bit. It enhances it. Likewise, the hypostatic union, the, the two natures of Christ. We have distinctions between his deity and his humanity, but he's still the same person of Jesus Christ. Sameness does not always produce unity, and differences do not always produce disunity. Unity and distinction are not necessarily incompatible concepts. They may be quite complementary, as indeed they are in dispensationalism. So anyway, that's a very important section right there. When it comes to the purpose, no dispensationalist minimizes the importance of God's saving purpose in the world. We're happy to be saved. The importance of his saving purpose is, is critical, but it's not the totality whether it is God's total purpose or even his principal purpose, is open to question. The dispensationalist sees a broader purpose, and so it's doxological, his glory, God's glory, rather than soteriology. It's, it's more than just salvation. For the dispensationalist, the glory of God is the governing principle and overall purpose. The soteriological program is a means to an end. It's a part getting you there. Good quote from Walverd, other things here. It is also curious, he includes some of the covenant guys who also stress the glory of God, and yet they run back to their, um, their salvation security blanket when they inject that uh, covenant of grace into all their, all their understandings. Here we go. How do we know that the glory of God is the purpose of God above and beyond his saving purpose? Well, haven't you been paying attention in the Ephesian series at Austin Bible Church? Okay. The plain statement of Scripture declares that salvation is to the praise of God's glory. Three times, to the praise of God's glory, to the praise of God's glory, which he simply means that redemption is one of the means to the end of glorifying God. That's Ephesians 1, verses 6, 12, and 14. To the praise of his glory. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Different ways that's expressed, but it's to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory to the praise of his glory. That one's to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved one. So yeah, saving us is part of the plan, but it's not the total plan. The glory of God is to be realized fully, not only in salvation, but also in the Jewish people and also in his purpose concerning angels. God will be glorified in the angels and be glorified in the nation of Israel. He's glorified in the church that there are different purposes for the different created beings. 
Now, I did make one fix on page 108. Dispensationalism not only sees the various dispensations as successive, but also progressive manifestations of God's purpose. So from, uh, from innocence to conscience to human government to promise to law to grace, and that not only are they sequential, they're also progressing and headed for the kingdom. The entire program culminates not in eternity, but in history. And Ryrie would say, in the millennial kingdom of the Lord Christ. I would say, in the eschatological theocratic kingdom, in other words, the uh, dispensation of the fullness of times, the thousand generations after the millennium. So slight adjustment there. A refinement, not an argument, not a fight, not picking on the, the millennial uh, be-all, end-all type people. Okay? Dispensationalism sees the unity, the variety, the progressiveness of this purpose of God for the world as no other system of theology. And the covenant guys, as much as they stress unity, they really create more problems than they solve. All right. Then the addendum, the Sermon on the Mount. Now this is, that gets us to page 109. The chapter actually goes six more pages to 115. And I mentioned this this morning because we touched upon Matthew 5. We touched, and the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so it's one of the flashpoint arguments by which the covenant guys will accuse us of uh, damaging our Bibles. We're throwing away, I mean, they're, they're very special to them. The Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer. The, there, there's many elements of the Sermon on the Mount that are very... Um, uh, very special to a lot of Christians, okay? Including dispensationalists. I don't have a problem with the Sermon on the Mount. I love the Sermon on the Mount, but I also understand that its primary application is to the millennial future of Israel, not to, uh, to the church. Our application is secondary, and I'm fine with that, okay? And this, this, this whole section here actually serves as a great way to walk through. I, I would like to do something similar to this uh, when, and, and we'll do this in hermeneutics, we'll do this in our Bible interpretation classes coming up. So how do I know? I mean, what can I glean from Old Testament passages? And then what can I glean from gospel passages? And, and you know, obviously the, the best for the church would be the epistles of the New Testament because those were written during the church age and for the church age, but we don't throw out the rest of our Bibles. So how do we handle the Old Testament? How do we handle the gospels? And, and where do we, how do we find the analogy between Israel's application and the church's application? That's, that's, that's important. And we're going to learn that skill set. <coughs> Why the Sermon on the Mount? Why is this made the focus of attack? Nobody ever criticizes the dispensationalists for teaching that the dietary regulations of Mosaic law have no application to the Christian. And that's not confrontational or problematic. The Sermon on the Mount, however, is different. It contains the golden rule, the Lord's Prayer, other favorite passages. Even to suggest that it's direct relation to the Christian, even to suggest that it's direct relation to the Christian is open to question and e inevitably involves people's emotions before their doctrine. And it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. Of course, the dietary laws are just as much inspired scripture as the Sermon on the Mount and uh, a fact that emotions easily overlook. So, different viewpoints. Is, is the Sermon on the Mount, is that a message of salvation? Well, that's a sad message of salvation if it is. Um, and even though, and, and was this, I think it was Hodges who challenged him or somebody challenged him saying, where in the Sermon on the Mount is the Christian gospel stated? Show me in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, show me a gospel message in the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, MacArthur replied, it's pure gospel. With as pointed an invitation as ever been presented. What verse? Where? Show me. Anyway. Um... If it is pure gospel, is it not presenting a works salvation gospel? <laughs> All right. Uh, another view. Well, it's for the church. Now, what do you mean by for? If by for you mean it's directly binding on the church, 
not merely by application of its principles, but by primary interpretation of its words, I can't go there. I can't go there because the church doesn't exist when Jesus is speaking it. The church is still mystery when he's speaking it. But Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I love Lloyd-Jones, I read his stuff, uh, he's just incorrect on this point. He says it's a perfect picture of life in the kingdom of God. Okay, but see, he would also say we're in the kingdom of God right now, and we're not. He describes the kingdom of God as essentially spiritual in contrast to the materialistic, political, and military conception held by the Jews of Jesus' time. Well, hello. If that's the view they held, why did they hold that? Because that's the literal understanding of the literal prophecies. All right. <laughs> George Ladd wants to be literal, but he can't. Even Jesus did not turn the other cheek. So we, we can't understand Matthew 5 with wooden literalness. A fudging literalness. This is kind of amusing. Um, all right, let's get down to the real, but here we go. If one does not recognize the dispensational distinctions in the Gospels, including the Sermon on the Mount, consistently literal interpretation will be abandoned to a lesser or greater degree. I mean, when, when the light bulb first comes on and you realize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all occur before Acts chapter 2. So the whole time Jesus is walking the earth, every time he's walking with his disciples, teaching, everything that takes place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John precede the day of Pentecost, if they're not church age. Yes, they're written in the Greek canon of Scripture, part of the New Testament text, but they're describing events that took place during the Old Testament, during the dispensation of Israel. Cannot lose track of that. Related to the kingdom. Related to the kingdom. Containing teachings and principles that do apply to the church, but it is primarily related to the coming kingdom. Schofield said, the Sermon on the Mount contains a beautiful moral application to the Christian. Schaefer said basically the same thing. A secondary application to the church means that lessons and principles may be drawn from it. And we can do that all the time. We do that with the whole Old Testament. We can do that with the Sermon on the Mount. So, now you can go to certain extremes. It relates only to the middle of the kingdom. There is no application today. You can ignore it. We don't ignore it because there are applications to be made today. It relates to any time the messianic kingdom is offered. That's, an, that's a, a nuanced position, and it's curious, because it was at hand at Jesus' first advent. It's going to be at hand again after the rapture and the tribulation. So it's offered. And then you can kind of blend with point three. It relates both to any time the kingdom is offered and to the time when the millennial kingdom is functioning on this earth. So both for the offering period and the kingdom itself that the, the Sermon on the Mount is valid, the expansions to kingdom law, the, the heart mental attitudes behind the external sinful deeds will be accountable in the millennial kingdom, part of kingdom law. Anyway, that's uh, the best understanding there. By the way, this section's not on your quiz. I ran out of enthusiasm and I did not include any Sermon on the Mount questions for your quiz. And here's the conclusion of the chapter. What does the dispensationalist say about the Sermon on the Mount? And so he speaks for himself, at least. Um, Ryrie suggests four things. It is a detailed explanation of what the Lord meant by repentance. Remember, along with the kingdom of heaven is at hand came the imperative, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Constantly. It called the Jewish people to an inner heart change that they had disassociated from the requirements for establishing the Messianic kingdom. So they were great at being legalistic law keepers, but without repentance, none of them were going to enter into the, into the millennial kingdom. Therefore, too, it relates to any time that the kingdom is offered, which, by the way, is not here and now. It is still suspended. The offer is suspended until after the rapture and, and until Israel is drawn to that point of repentance then the offer will be re-extended. Re Three, it also relates to life in the millennial kingdom. And four, as with all scripture, the sermon is applicable and profitable to believers in this age. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Even lists of names in Genesis 22. 
that we can glean principles, we can, we can learn from the names, we can learn from the, the things. I thought the temptation for Abraham to return to the land of his birth that Hebrews highlights, I thought that was a, a significant, profound point in, uh, in Genesis 22 this morning. I'm not sure that everybody caught that or not, but it was uh, more than just a list of names in our second hour. Anyway, so we're almost done. This is the heart of the dispensationalist interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. Is it so bad? At least it does justice to literal interpretation. The consistency of one's hermeneutical principle is far more important than the defense of one's theological system. I would agree. And by the way, this is why VMI has this approach. All the mission agencies I've been a part of, when I've gone to the Philippines, we were teaching hermeneutics. When I went to Africa, we were teaching hermeneutics. When we go to Ukraine, not anymore, but when we were going to Ukraine, we were teaching hermeneutics. You get these native pastors in their own language studying the Bible for themselves. The first thing they have to be grounded in is, is hermeneutics. You don't worry about the theology. You don't worry about the dispensationalism. They will get there on their own if they use the right hermeneutic consistently. They can't help but become dispensationalists with the right hermeneutic used consistently. So, we can appreciate that. All right, questions. Okay, it's got a microphone to the back row there. If we could, please. Mari had a question. She needs to be rewarded for that beautiful purple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, this is probably very elementary, but um, what is this um, covenant of grace in a nutshell that the okay. non-dispensationalists are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it is a framework that was invented in the 17th century as a theological interpretive grid whereby you could view um, mankind as functioning, first of all, under a covenant of works, but they blew it because they, they ate from the wrong tree and they, they became sinners. And then once they were sinners, then God instituted a covenant of grace. And so it's, it's a way to, it has nothing to do with the Noahic covenant, the Adamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, the things we study consistently as the literal covenants of the literal text. But they are understood implicitly as the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And so they, they infuse that into their Old Testament, New Testament passages alike. Uh, strangely, I'd never heard of that. For a second, I thought it meant that um, right. people misinterpret the new covenant, which I know this is not what it means. But no, that's not that at all. Okay. Yeah, they, they ignore that. Yeah. There's also supposedly an, an eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. And that one actually I can find inferences to in the scriptures, but it's not the covenant of grace that the covenant theology insists on. Yes, sir. Pastor Bob. Whether it's today or 2,000 years ago, how did a Jewish person, unbeliever, look at Christ as it relates to the sin issue? I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. 2,000 years ago? 2,000 years ago, a Jewish person, unbeliever, and the religious people didn't have any connection as it relates to the sin issue the, the sins needed to be judged. It seems to have been a, an issue that they just buried. No, I would disagree. I think every year there was a reminder of sin, year after year. Every time the Day of Atonement came around, there was a reminder of sins year after year. I'm Hebrews not, makes that point. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the unbelieving religious people, though. Uh-huh. There had to be a disconnect in terms they could have a ritual of the sin issue, but they weren't willing to accept that the sins needed to be judged on the God-man Christ. And then the second question is, if Christ uh, is, um, if they did accept him, the sin issue still would have had to been dealt with. Right, right. All the Old Testament believers who were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They were looking forward to a coming Messiah. And so they were saved, they were made alive, they were given eternal life, their sins were forgiven, but they were, their sins were covered. 
as he passed over, he didn't judge them, he passed over them because he was looking forward to the cross. And so they died, they didn't go to heaven when they died, they went to Abraham's bosom when they died. It was only after the cross that the sins were not just covered but removed and then with their sins removed, all the Old Testament saints could then be uh, rescued uh, from captivity captive and they were brought to heaven. That's why paradise is in heaven today instead of Abraham's bosom. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. But the question is, something still would have had to been done with the sin issue. The sins would still have to in some way been judged on, on Christ, whether he laid down on the altar, if they were accepting their uh, the kingdom accepting Christ, the oh, oh, sins oh. still had to have been judged, yes. is what I'm saying. Yes, yes. Had, had Israel responded positively and, and repented and been humble to accept the kingdom, there still would have been a necessary crucifixion, a necessary work of redemption, a necessary atonement. Um, yes, clearly. And, and how would that have happened? If, if it wouldn't have been the Jews betraying him, would it have been the Romans? Who would it have been? We just don't know what the, the parallel alternative history of that might be. Also, how does the church come about on that model? If they enter right into their kingdom, then where does, the, where does, the bride, where does Christ receive his bride? Now, we don't have to worry about that what if, because that's not what happened. But assuming that there was a viable offer and there was a potential for that to be accepted, then clearly God would have had a plan for, for that contingency as well, but not, uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't what he chose to actualize. But then you would also still have the same angelic conflict issues as it relates to of, um, Satan's I wills uh -huh. and resolving that issue in a different way. Mm -hmm. it, it just wouldn't be in the same time sequence and, and it would be Yeah, it would have been entirely way. different and we, don't, it would, we have no way to know. But God does. He knows all those alternatives. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, up front here, please. Oh, did you have one also? No, okay. Brenda has one right there. You talked about this grid development in the early 17th century for uh -huh. the Covenant of Works and Grace. Who yeah. were the men that did that? The successors to Calvin and Zwingli. Yeah, so in between Calvin and Dort, I think it was in there. You know, one, one thing you can do in your Logos software, open up your fact book. You got uh, home, library, search, Bible, fact book. Open up your fact book and then type in covenant theology. And you'll see the concept there of covenant theology. You also have other things like uh, covenant of works, covenant of salt, covenant keeper. I mean, there's a whole lot to look there. But just start with covenant theology as a concept. And it'll give you a, a, a neat rundown here, just in this window, in the fact book window, with the key article, and, of course, that's clickable. You can open up that reference. And then um, media, dictionaries, journals, sermons, books from your library, fact book tags. I'm sure I've got books in my library on Covenant. Yeah, there we go. And um, it's not fun to read because you pull your hair out every time they, they dump the literal hermeneutic and decide to inject something else in there. But it is available, and you can read it for yourself. And, uh, and then if you don't have enough, then they'll sell you even more books <laughs> in the bookstore there. So yeah, start there. If you, want to, if you really want to learn more about covenant theology, I, I can't say that I recommend it, but for, uh, for Jeremiah and, and Emilio and any of our pastoral candidates, I mean, you've got to be at least aware of it and somewhat familiar with the hermeneutic that takes them there. So, um, you know, you can address it. But obviously we're going to major on our literal hermeneutic and we're going to major in our dispensational theology. Good question. Thank you. Okay, last call. Anything on YouTube? Anything from the desk? Anything from... Okay. Thank you for running the microphone. Appreciate that. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day, for your grace, for your faithfulness, for all of your blessings in our lives. Father, thank you for the literal interpretation, for the plain language. It's the interpretation our Savior employed, and we, uh, we're His imitators as we employ the same hermeneutic ourselves. It's the only way to be noble-minded, to search the Scriptures and see, see if these things are so. So, Father, we thank You and praise You in Christ's name. Amen.
All right, for next week, we are having class on Easter Sunday, and you do need to read. The only week we're going to miss is April the 14th. If you're looking ahead three weeks out, we will not have class on April 14th, but that is the only Sunday we're going to miss between now and May 25th. All right, thank you. Austin Bible Church is a grace ministry. No price is ever assigned to any video, audio, printed material, or anything provided by this ministry. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.